the very in standard time. Normally it would be like 10, 15, 10, 20, something like that. This is the Religion and Liberty panel, and I'm Daryl W. Perry. I am representing uh, what most people would call the Christian faith. I actually don't like calling it Christianity because so many people have bastardized what the faith actually is. And Davi Barker is representing Islam. Davi has written a wonderful book, Voluntary Islam and Other Essays. It's actually available, I think, in uh, two locations here in uh, Workfest. I think you. I think you have it at the. I'm I'm selling it at Lazy Goat, and I think you have some copies. I, have, at the... I just have just a few copies. I'm probably going to just carry them on me because I move around so much, but uh, I'll have them with me. Yeah, I, I saw some at the uh, Laconia Free Market. That's where they are. Right yeah. And I have also written a book. It's titled The Anarcho Teachings of Yeshua. That is available at the Lazy Goat as well. And I'm actually doing a deal, not to really you know, go off on a promotion, but uh, if you purchase three books that I have, then the third book is half price. So three books for, or three books for $25. So I, I got the idea to do this panel after seeing the Atheist panel last year. And I was thinking, wait a sec, how are they doing a religion panel that's full of atheists? And then I looked in the schedule and saw that it was actually like a you know pro-atheist panel. And I was like, well, you know, there there are a lot of libertarians that have religious beliefs and they don't really know how to really talk to the people that they go to church with about the ideas of liberty without sounding totally weird and crazy. So I got the idea to not only, you know, make it to where you can talk to your Christian friends about liberty, but also Muslim friends if you have any. And I would have liked to have had some other faiths represented, but it's really hard finding, you know, Buddhist or Hindu libertarians. Uh, I know that there are a couple of Jewish libertarians and I just wasn't able to uh, get things worked out with them. But hopefully, you know, me and Davi can you know, present some of the main ideas of libertarianism and show how they fit within the different faiths. And this is a panel sort of thing. And I'm not really sure what topic to start with. Davi, do you have any ideas? I mean, I think uh, maybe just an introduction. To, Certainly. Like, not, not just who you are, but what you believe, for yeah. example. So like when you say, uh, that you that you don't like the word Christianity and your yes. book is uh, the anarcho teachings of Yeshua. Yes. So I mean that's libertarian, yes, be. libertarians. We all understand the importance of language, right? So I could understand why anybody of a liberty mindset would would want to immediately attack the language of the authoritarian interpretation. So could you give us yes. some of that? Yeah, uh, certainly. And for those who aren't familiar, Yeshua is the Aramaic name for the man that most people call Jesus, and I actually prefer the original Aramaic for several reasons uh, and one of the few reasons is actually that the letter J wasn't introduced into the English language until well after the original King James Version of the Bible was written and if you have ever found a copy of the original 1611 <laughs> King James you will notice that uh, the name of the Messiah is written Iesus it's actually, they transliterate it from the Greek. Because most of the New Testament was written in Greek, it wasn't written in Hebrew or Aramaic, because Greek was pretty much you know, the common language of the Mediterranean area. And Latin being you know, for most of the Roman Empire, and a lot of Bibles now are translated from translations of translations of the Vulgate, which was the popular Latin version. So I say all of that to basically explain why I use the Aramaic name in the book. And one of the reasons that I don't like using the term Christianity is, you know, as I alluded to, so many Christians bastardized what Jesus taught, or Yeshua. And there are a lot of you know, very pro-war people calling themselves Christians. And that just seems opposite of the peaceful message of the Messiah, of love one another. What part of love one another can be interpreted to let's go kill people that live on the other side of the world? 
And uh, I'm sure most people have heard the quote from Gandhi, where Gandhi said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. They are so unlike your Christ. Because the Messiah, he said, you know, if someone doesn't have a cloak and he asks you for your cloak, give him your cloak. And there were other instances where he said, you know, basically give everything you have to the poor. And there are some people that say that that's to be taken literal of give every possession you have and run around naked. But I, I look at it a little differently and look at it of just help people. You know, if you have something and somebody is without, you know, don't deprive yourself of life to give them, you know, food for the day. But if you've got some extra bread, give the man some bread. If you can teach the man to fish, great, that's all the better. But that, as I said, you know, so many people just bastardize what Christianity is and what most of the churches now pass off as Christianity is a state sanitized version. Because there's the 501c3 registration that the IRS says that all churches have to have, but if you actually read their laws, you don't actually have to file to be tax exempt. But when you do file and get that 501c3, then basically you're making the state your God instead of God being your God. And so then you have to water down the message and have to water down the teachings in order to basically get the handout from the government of, oh yes, you still get our blessing to where you don't have to give us money. So that's where I'm coming from with Christianity, or what I prefer the term Messianic Gentile. And again, it goes back to the you know, original... There were Jews and Gentiles. If you weren't of Jewish descent, you were a Gentile. Doesn't matter, you know, what ethnicity you were. And the people that are of Jewish descent that follow the teachings of Yeshua, they consider themselves the Messianic Jews. So, sort of a play on that. I consider myself a Messianic Gentile. So that's where I'm coming from. And I know we discussed a little bit that you actually became a Muslim after you were a libertarian, I believe. It all kind of happened simultaneously. Um, I want to talk a little bit about language because I have... Um, Certainly. I've kind of the op I mean, It's not really a problem, but Islam has sort of the opposite um, relationship with language because the, the Quran is still is in its original language and it's still a spoken language and there are still scholars that study um, that study its original meaning. So you don't really have a struggle over vocabulary, you have a struggle over definitions. Um, because the original words that were used are known. So for, for example, this is one of my favorites. There's, this, there's a place in the Quran where it talks about a group of people and one of them says to the other, uh, go into town and uh, buy some food. And he uses the word warik, and that means silver coin, literally silver, like is in the definition originally. But if you look at modern standard Arabic, warik means paper. <laughs> so, like, so, how did that happen? I have no idea how that happened. Uh, but so, if you look at older translations, it actually says, "Take this silver coin and go and go and buy some food." And if you look at modern definitions or modern translations, now they say, "Take this money and go and buy." And it's because they're trying to expunge precious metals from the literature because none of the governments there anymore use precious metals. And so they have this sort of tension with dealing with the scripture originally because that's what they're claiming is their source of legitimacy, right? So there's a lot of things like that where there's plays on words and, and words have these like fluctuating definitions and you have these like words that are scary because people use them incorrectly. Um, so I don't, I don't, I really don't feel like I have the luxury of inventing terms for myself. I use the word Muslim uh, Muslims in, in, in co like common parlance have all these other like modifiers, like adjectives, like they'll use Salafi or Maliki or Sufi or, you know, and so these all have meanings, but they're not like uh, sectarianism necessarily because everybody's claiming to be a Muslim. So uh, I, try, I choose not to use any of those adjectives and to just say that I'm Muslim because I'm, I'm practicing what I believe to be correct. And if you think that what you are practicing is correct, then you can use whatever adjectives you want if that describes you, but it's just not valuable to me. Okay, so a quick question. You said that uh, some of the different terms to 
sort of you know hyphenate yeah. Islam. Most like of them are native the, people. Uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. Right. The, the, I always thought that those were different sects or those, different those denominations. Two are, those two are the closest thing you can get to a de denominational. So it's sort of like you know, there's Baptist and Methodist and Episcopalian. There, there are so many different so, variations uh, of what is being promoted as Christianity. So if you want to get kind of, if you want to stand back and take a sort of loose look, you could say that Sunni and Shia is similar to Protestant and Catholic. Okay. Except that they happened at the same time. It's not like one split off at some point in history. It's essentially so like there was no Muslim Martin Luther. Not really. Uh, okay. Essentially, it was a political disagreement early in in Islamic history, and because uh, Islam or religion was tied to politics, the people that followed one leader and the people that followed another leader adopted different names for themselves. And at the time, the religion was the same, but those two, because of the schism, have evolved into something different. And so now you have theological differences where there weren't originally. But but within each of those. There are camps that describe the scholars that you think are correct because there's this sort of decentralized element of Islamic scholarship all through history. So if you call yourself a Hanafi, that means, well, I'm a Muslim, but I, I believe that Imam Abu Hanifa was correct on a lot of these things. And there's this sort of concept that you can follow any number of these scholars and it's all considered valid. Okay, that to some extent is sort of the way Christianity is divided up. Or yeah, there was, I, I forget the guy that started the uh, Methodist church. Uh, Calvin was definitely one of the Methodist uh, mm -hmm. leaders. So there are people that follow certain theologies of certain people. That's why they're you know, Methodist or Baptist or... Um, to some extent, it, it is. I mean, I've never been Christian, so I can't say for certain it's the same or different. But... Um, there's also a lot of... Well, I, I don't mean it's the exact same, but it, it's similar. They call these schools of, of thought, and there's a lot of school hopping. So, like, okay. if you were raised in Pakistan, there's a 99% chance you will raise Hanafi. Okay. But there's no, there's no, like, theological objection within families or communities if you happen to follow the rulings of another school on certain issues. Okay, okay. Um, so, it's kind of broad in that way. So what are the Muslim teachings on taxation? Because taxation, right. pretty much everybody knows the scripture where the Pharisees showed Yeshua the coin and said, so is it proper to pay taxes? And he said, well, let me see the coin that you have. And he said, whose face is on this? And they replied, Caesar. And he said, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to Yahweh what is Yahweh's. And there, there are a lot of interpretations of what was meant by that. And if you purchase my book, I actually take it in a totally different direction and make it an argument against central banking. And I, I realize that I'm probably you know, interpreting it in a way that most people have never interpreted that scripture. But most people don't realize that the temple had its own money. So whenever you went to the temple to give your tithe, you actually had to convert your money from whatever currency you had to temple currency. And so that's why Yeshua said, whose face is on the coin? Give that coin to whoever it belongs to, is essentially what he said. But there's also in the Old Testament, and I personally don't fall under the Old Testament because my belief of what Christianity is is that Yeshua fulfilled the Old Testament law. The 613 laws in Leviticus, I don't have to try to follow those. Because there, there are a lot of really weird things in Leviticus that most people don't realize. That there are a lot of, like the Westboro Baptist types that want to point out, you know, one or two verses that speak ill of homosexuality. But they totally forget the verse that says you are not to ink your body. They forget the verse that says you're not to mix fabrics in your clothing. Which means that every 50-50 cotton polyester blend, you're all going to hell if you believe that you must abide by the Levitical law. Sure. You also can't plant two different types of crops in your field. You, you can't have corn and tomatoes in the field together. That, that is a sin. You can't eat crawfish. You can't eat lobster. So if you like seafood, 
definitely do not become Jewish or Muslim. Because I, I realized the Jewish and Muslim... No, Muslims uh, eat seafood. Uh, I thought that they had the same diet. No, they, uh, there's one school of thought that has adopted the Judaic law, but it doesn't come from any Islamic source. Okay. So, <laughs> there uh, are uh, Muslims who imitate Jewish law and will not eat shellfish, but it doesn't yeah. come from any Islamic so, source. Uh, I believe that you know people that follow the teachings of Yeshua are under the New Covenant, and the New Commandment, when someone asked Yeshua, what is the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And before Yeshua was crucified, he told his disciples, he said, a new commandment that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So the 613 Levitical laws are basically obsolete unless you are Jewish and you believe that that's the path that you're supposed to live under. So uh, I prefer not to pay taxes. I avoid them at all costs. And I don't believe that I am violating the teachings of Yeshua to you know, give money to whoever's face is on it because I don't believe that they have the authority over me to say that you know, I owe them 10%. There are a lot of Christians that will then look at the writings of the Apostle Paul and say, well, in Romans it says blah, 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 blah. Well, that's the teachings of Paul. That's not the teachings of Yeshua. And so many Christian churches now are basically, you know, they're, they're Paulian. They're, they're not even Christian. They're, they're teaching the teachings of Paul, not the teachings of the Messiah. So on taxes, I don't think it's wrong or a sin to avoid tax at all. What is the Muslim belief okay. on that so um there's no the muslim there's no the muslim belief but um so let me tell you something economics has taught me about religion and i think that this applies to all religion i'm sure many of you are familiar with Keynes and hayek right and that there was there was this conflict between Keynes and hayek about the nature of monetary policy and a number of other economic issues and if you look back at the history hayek totally won the debate right he, he won the debates that they were in he won the awards his predictions came true while Keynes did not and yet, Keynes is the, the, the um, let's say, dogma of statist economics today. Well, why is that? It's because states will always favor the scholars that legitimize their authority. So um, coming uh, from a long like scholarly tradition in any religion, you have to look at the history of scholarship with this lens, that throughout the entirety of, of most religious history, religion and the state was the same thing. And so you have to keep in mind that the interpretations that prevailed did not prevail because they were true. They did not prevail because there was a free market in ideas and they were more correct. They prevailed because, or at least the possibility exists that they prevailed, because the states elected those scholars to be the court scholars to make that the normative practice of the religion. So the normative teaching of Islam there is a taxation, and I'm going to explain why I think that it's incorrect. So. Um, you have a little bit of a different thing than Christianity. In Christianity, you have an empire and you have a rebel, and so you, 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 have, you, have an easy, you have an example to say that this rebel is objecting to these things about this state. But Muhammad was born in a polycentric tribal anarchy. There was no established state in Mecca at the time. You had tribes, and there were sort of like clan structures and clan hierarchies and leaders, but there was no, there was no monopoly in any sense of the word. And Muhammad himself was from the largest tribe in Mecca, which was the Quraysh. And he was there at a time when they were just beginning to impose a tax. They were saying that because they were the biggest tribe and because they were sort of, they had homesteaded the city of Mecca, they could tax all of the people who came through to trade. And Mecca was a trade city. And so part of Muhammad's mission was to abolish that, right? So the only like pre-existing example of a tax in his life was something that he rejected and something that he was at. So assassination attempts are made on him by them because he was preaching against their tax and because he was preaching to liberalize the Meccan market again. Um, but because in, if you ever study um, like polycentric tribal systems, ten, the tendency is with justice to be restorative instead of punitive. And so there are plenty of examples in Muhammad's life where he was called upon as an arbiter and he imposed a financial burden as a punishment for something, as a form of restorative justice. And so those examples have been used by scholars years later to, to legitimize a tax. 
<laughs> if that makes sense. And they'll say that the, the descendants of those people that he made that ruling on now continue to owe this tax for all time. And that's not something he said, but that's what, that's what the court scholars have used to create a legitimate tax, if that makes sense. And I think it's totally false, obviously. Um, so he never, so you have a, a figure who comes into what is essentially an anarchy. He opposes what is the only thing even remotely close to a state, and he does not create a state in his stead. He instead sort of maintains a polycentric nature to the society. So he's not as strong a figure of opposing the state, but the fact that he never establishes it in the first place says that that's not the point. Um, so for people that aren't familiar, can you explain what a polycentric yeah, okay. society is? I, I use the, the term uh, polycentric tribal anarchy. It's a term that was coined by Spencer McCullen in his book, uh, The Law of Somalia, where he talks about the, the legal system in Somalia. And the idea is that uh, rather than having a monopoly on law, you have uh, essentially tribes or clans or or uh, in many in many uh, periods in history, they're totally like voluntary associations. Like you can leave one clan and join another. It's not necessarily a bloodline, um, and they have competing agreements between organizations, and they compete for the consent of the members of their clan. And so um, I think that it is essentially a proto version of Molyneux's dispute resolution organization where you have many competing dispute organizations that compete for, for the consent of members. And because in those periods of history it made sense for them to be along bloodlines, most of them were, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, so they, they call it polycentric because there's no state, there's no monopoly, you have many competing agencies offering dispute resolution services or arbitration or, or whatever their judges and courts of law think is law. And um, tribal because it was historically tribal and it was tribal in Muhammad's life. Uh, an anarchy because it's an anarchy if there's no state. So, um, I mean, that's that's the society that most tribal societies, that's the way most tribal societies were structured and that was the environment that he was alive in. Okay, and what I would like to do, instead of just talking about what I think people want to hear, what Dobby thinks people might want to hear, I definitely want to open it up for questions. Uh, there are two microphones, one on each side. So if anybody has any questions of any kind, feel free to stand up. Make sure you speak directly into the microphone and we'll answer any questions that you have. Yes, Pam. How you doing, Daryl? Doing well. Good. Um, I don't really have a question, but I do have a comment to add to something that you said. Sir. Um, I'm Roman Catholic. I do go to church all the time. And uh, um, it's, it's kind of ironic that if you when you hear the priests talk about the gospel, they put the tax collectors in with the criminals and the sinners and the prostitutes. Yes, and, and it's, just to sort of cut you off for a second, it's very interesting that those are the people that the Messiah chose as his disciples. Basically what was viewed as the worst of the worst. Yes. Because they need to hear the truth the most. And I, have, I don't know if you can answer this, but as a Roman Catholic, I find that I do have a lot of problems um, when I bring up my political philosophy because they're under the impression that the state has the right, it's, it's um, a Christian thing to do to, uh, to pay taxes so that for welfare and, and everything else that, that I oppose. And I, I am having a hard time trying to, you know, trying to point out to them that this is not, that Jesus was not a socialist. Right, and there's a really good essay, whether you necessarily agree with his politics or not, Pastor Chuck Baldwin, who ran for president in 08 as the Constitution Party's nominee, he has written a very good essay on re-looking at Romans 13, which is the chapter where, you know, it's what most churches take out of context, and because Paul wrote, everyone must submit to authority. And most churches teach that the authority you submit to is the government. Well, I disagree. I, I think that the authority that you submit to is the Almighty, and that means everybody. You, the government, if there is a government, and we all know that you know, pretty much every square inch of Earth is claimed by some government somewhere. Whether you agree that it's legitimate or not, you know, 
face the fact every square inch of Earth is claimed by some government. And coming from more of you know a hardcore libertarian, I, I prefer the term anarch if I'm going to say anarch or anarchist, uh, because it, the archaic definition of anarch is one who supports anarchy, and it comes from the Greek that means uh, without a leader. I forget the actual term that anarch came from. Anarchy itself comes from you know no rulers. But I, I come at it from the point that no one has more rights than anyone else. Which means if I don't have the right to steal your stuff, then me and five of my buddies don't have the right to steal your stuff, and me and 5,000 of my buddies have no more right to steal your stuff than me by myself. So I, I look at it you know, from that perspective, but if you're talking about how to get say your priest to understand that I, I really hate to refer people to books but I think The Law by Frederick Bastiat is a very good beginner book for somebody that's already coming from a sort of religious perspective of you know I want to do good because Bastiat came from that same sort of perspective of he, he's got the quote that's very famous of when law and morality contradict the man is left with you know, the choice of which does he follow does he follow what he knows is right or what he knows will wind up you know, possibly costing his life if he doesn't abide by so if you're looking for something you know, where you can give somebody basically a book that they can read in an afternoon get a copy of the law give it to your priest but as far as like something to actually say to, there aren't magic words that you can say in a certain way to make anybody agree with whatever you agree with. Uh, I would just uh, remind him, show him examples of when Yeshua fed people. He didn't force anybody to feed people. There, there were, what, 5,000 people at uh, the mountain by the Sea of Galilee and he was like, hey, does anybody have some fish? And there were like seven fish. And he blessed them. And there are some people that say that that was an actual miracle. Other people say that wasn't a miracle. That actually what happened is he basically said grace and started passing around the food. And then people said, wait a second, you know, I do actually have an extra loaf of bread. And so people started giving from what they didn't really want to give up to begin with. So it's like stone soup. Yes, to where you know basically everybody started to pitch in on what they had, so but there there was never any instance in the life of the Messiah to where he forced anyone to do anything. It was always this is right, and people either chose to do it or they didn't. Thank you. Something that has worked for me with similar problems in my own community with that because we have different sources and so different things work, but. Um, I like to put an emphasis on oaths because there's um, there's a strong tradition of of the, the the importance of a person's word and the importance of the oaths that one takes and things like that. And the only sense in which somebody has a uh, a, a legitimate membership in a tribe or a clan, if you look at like the the way that the societies used to be structured, is if they have an oath to that clan, right? So when people talk to me about the government and whether or not I have any obligation to them, I like to say I have no oaths with them. And that, that carries a lot of weight because there's a lot, there's a strong sort of oath-breaking and oath-keeping cu uh, culture in Muslim societies. And so to say that you have no oath with them and they really have no oath with you is sort of like, it, it's part and parcel to having no obligation to them. I don't know if that would work in your, in your church, but I mean, that's a strategy that you can think about if, if, if that resonates with, with your tradition. Yeah, and just to sort of go off of that for a second, uh, a lot of Christians, especially here in the United States, love to point out the founding documents of America. So just show them in the Declaration of Independence where it says that governments are created with the consent of the governed. I never consented to this thing that exists in Washington, D.C. And I don't consent to the thing that exists in Concord, New Hampshire, but at least what exists in Concord, New Hampshire isn't as bad as the thing in D.C. 
Uh, I prefer the Shire Society myself, but it's not recognized by any government around the world. Although, as the self-declared Emperor of Earth, and I did that on an episode of Free Talk Live, sort of on a whim, and I've been going with it ever since. So as the Emperor of Earth, I recognize the Shire Society as a valid government, and it's totally consensual. So, you know, basically, well, what I'm saying is people that regard the founding documents as, you know, basically akin to modern scripture, point them to that and say, wait a second, but this says, with the consent of the government, I've never consented to having my body stolen so that people don't have to work or so that we can kill people overseas. And from what I know, I, I've never been to a Roman Catholic church, but I have had some friends that are Catholic. It's my understanding that the Catholic church is very liberal in a lot of ways, but then very conservative in the social sphere. And just something that you could show is that, you know, the Messiah never forced his beliefs on anyone. He just told people, you know, this is right. And people either followed it or they did not. And there was never force or, or coercion at all. That there was a lot of that in the Old Testament, but that's been wiped away. Any other questions? Looks like we have somebody over here. Uh, speak directly into the mic, please. No problem. So, um, mine was actually, about that. Mine was actually a, a follow-up when you're talking about, um, you know, because I'm not Catholic, but I'm Christian. A lot of people have the same kind of Caesar to Caesar and good citizen thing. Um, and uh, well, I'm not sure if this is an example that you've encountered, but some people also say, point to um, in early church in like Acts, when says, the Bible says all things were in common, and basically it was sort of a commune in the sense that like around Paul and a lot of other people, um, I think Peter and the, the people would come and bring their 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 what they had, and they would donate land and they'll donate resources. But the thing that's important about that is that it was voluntary. Yeah, you know, it was totally voluntary. It was, and it was, and it was even 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 one of the like probably the most severe miracles, you know, or, or detrimental miracles in the New Testament, which was when someone lied about how much portion they, they, they pledged to it, wasn't because they didn't, they, you know, it was because they lied about it. It wasn't because I don't want to give this up. It was right. totally voluntary. If they, if they said, I don't want to donate any land at all, the church wasn't going to come and get them for it. Right. And in that, in that kind of state, you know, because I've heard people, some people say, well, you know, Christ come almost a little socialist. And it's, it's in that ideal state of, and if you're a Christian, it's in the union of, community with God and you know it's the only way that, that kind of thing can exist is in a voluntary and non uh, force down kind of situation yes. and there's actually uh, archaeological proof that such communities existed the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1949 and archaeologists have done a lot of digging in that area and discovered basically a commune of a group called the Essenes, who were a very distinct sect of Christianity, and they have actually found some of the most accurate reproductions of Old Testament text in these communes, because they put them in the clay jars, they were buried in the sand, which preserves text very well, and they actually documented their own life and their own history so, yeah, the Essenines, they, there's archaeological proof of that community, and they were wiped out during the Roman War of, I think it was, AD 70. So, yeah, there, there's proof that, you know, basically Christian communes existed, and again, they were completely voluntary. There was no force. It wasn't one of these, you know, like, uh, Westboro Baptist sort of brainwash you into the cult sort of thing. Or even, uh, what was the one down in uh, Guyana, uh, the Jonestown cult, where they were you know, basically manipulating Christianity of, oh, where it says love one another, that means that everybody has to have sex with the preacher, and you can't you know, reproduce with anybody else, so that then only the preacher has offspring. But those are definitely you know, bastardizations and manipulations 
to get people into a commune. It wasn't voluntary. I, mean, I, 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 I think that it's like it's practically axiomatic, like that um, a thing doesn't have any ethical content if it isn't voluntary. Like a lot of these things are about accountability. Like in any religion, it's about which actions uh, you're accountable for, um, either like earthly or ultimately. And if you didn't choose to do a thing, there's no right sense in which you're accountable for it. So whether it's a good action or a bad action, if it's not voluntary, there, there, it doesn't make any sense to say that you're that you're accountable for it either either as a sin or a court. So like if I held your if I held a gun to your head and I told you to pray or not to pray, like I can't imagine that like it's like we always say God knows our heart, right? So like that has something to do with an internal mechanism that is beyond our outward our outward actions, right? So the reason for that is is because God knows our consent, He knows our intention, He knows what we're doing voluntarily. So even if the coercion is invisible, if we're doing something um, because we're feeling threatened, like it's a different, it's a different kind of an action than doing the same thing voluntarily. So it doesn't make any sense to say that you have a system of accountability that isn't voluntary. I guess right. Uh, I have a resource for this lady's question. Uh, about something to back you up regarding you don't need to pay your taxes. First, I want to admit that I don't have the courage yet to not pay my taxes. And I'm kind of amazed how strong these statements are that I'm about to reference. But if you go, I have found a lot of wonderful quotes at brainyquotes.com. I love that website. B r a i n y q u o t e s dot com, and if you put in, after you go to brainyquotes dot com, if you enter the search for Thomas Jefferson, you will find a wealth of comments that go way beyond what I feel I could comfortably do now to not have to pay your taxes. That people shouldn't have, shouldn't pay if they don't think it's being used correctly, um, and then branching out from there, Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. Um, so Brainy quotes that I mean, then I would, then you could just put in word like taxes or something like that. But BrainyQuotes.com has a lot of wonderful quotes about that. And, and the term that uh, Bastiat uses is plunder. He says that you know. That there are three options for a society. Either some plunder some, everyone plunders everyone, or no one plunders anyone. I prefer the third to where nobody plunders anyone. I, I prefer the third also. <laughs> I have I have more questions than we could possibly get to, so I'll start Certainly. with I'll, I'll start with one of the three. Let's I, do one at a time and see I how made, much time we want. But want before I get to the questions, I want to make a couple comments about some things that you said. Um, Certainly. Going back to Romans 13, I think it's important to point out that uh, if you only read a couple of the lines, you can kind of be misled. The whole context gives a little bit and more information. that's what most churches do, is they only yeah. read a couple of the they lines only read a couple and then misread lines. people. When you read the description of the people who are the rulers, what you see is very different than what we see today. Now, ironically, that was also the case when Paul wrote that. Yes. And so he may have been speaking kind of tongue-in-cheek. The rulers are there to punish the evildoer, right? You know, and uh, so if you read it that way, we see something very different today. Secondly, if you're, yeah, they, they, punish, they punish the good doers um, more so than they punish the evildoers. Uh, secondly, about Leviticus, I, um, there's, and I'm not uh, Jewish, but there's an interesting uh, bit of thought there that I think a lot of modern day Christians are not aware of. Most of those uh, purity codes, let's call them, are uh, there to demonstrate, in fact, that very concept, the concept of purity or unmixedness. So even yes. though we, went, we wouldn't hold to that, it's a visible outward thing. You know, uh, my clothing is one way, my fields are one way, and that's a, it's a sign, it's a symbol. I don't think that's a thing for all people for all time. But they had a, a, a calling, let's say, to demonstrate that, to show the world in practical ways that we can see that concept of purity as a, well, let's say, reflection of the nature of God, it was part of the nature of God. Or a uh, test of faith. That's right. If you could abide by all 613 laws, and no man could except for the Messiah. Right. And, and, and the content of it was it's, it's pure. So, so not yes. only was there a lot of it, but, but it, uh, many of them related to purity. In other words, we've done it perfectly. It's, right. it's, 
it's uh, showing the standard of perfection that anything less is not good enough. And uh, before you get to your next point, just something that I find interesting is that the prohibition against eating certain types of seafood and eating swine, there actually are some health reasons to oh, that sure. because if you don't cook those things properly, then you can get all kinds of bacteria. Yeah. So it's not necessarily you know that God thought pigs were evil. It was there are you know some health benefits because if it's not cooked properly, you might get sick and die. So don't do this. But it was also a test of faith. To, if you could abide by all of these things, then you prove that you were a good person. And I think there's also some perception of, you know, clean, dirty. Yes. Uh, and that's probably a man manly perception, but but showing that to the rest of the world, yes, could be uh, insightful. Uh, the que the first question I really wanted to ask, and and Debbie, if you'd like to go first, that'd be okay. I've I've never shied away from controversy, so um, in the history of both Christianity and Islam, there's a lot of violence. Um, uh, actually, in Jewish history, if you go far enough back, of course, there's a lot of violence. And there are cases in the uh, Old Testament of God says, go to war with these people, and so they go to war with these people. And there's a mixed record of... Kill uh, everyone in Canaan. Kill everyone in Canaan, right? There's a mixed record um, in Jewish history of a single out the ones who, who did good versus just destroy all men, women, and children, and uh, you know leave no survivors. Uh, in modern times, we see... Um, Ex different kinds of examples of violence, both uh, amongst Christians and amongst Muslims. But what interests me is what do the texts say and what do the, let's say, acceptable interpretations give us with respect to when the use of violence is uh, warranted? So if you'd sure. like to speak to that, I'd like Well, I mean, the famous one is uh, kill all the pagans wherever you find them, right? That's uh, <laughs> chapter 9, verse 5 of the Quran. And the next verse is, except those with whom you have a peace treaty, or except those with whom ask peace from you, or except those whom have not aggressed against you, for God does not love the aggressors. Which puts a completely different context on this verse. Totally different. <laughs> so, um, that, that has been used by both Muslims and non-Muslims to say that the normative practice of Islam is violence against everyone at all times. Uh, because they don't read the next verse. But if you look at, um, there's a specific historical battle in which that was taking place, where that, where that verse was given, and it was specifically about a particular pagan tribe that had murdered a particular Muslim tribe, and they were sort of like going from Mecca to Medina to seek well, restitution, and they offered restitution first. Muhammad, when he arrived in Mecca, he offered for them to play a blood, a blood price, or they offered to pay them for the murders instead of having this war. And so um, he gives them three options. He says that you can either pay the families whom you've, you've murdered, or, um, I'm, I can't believe I'm forgetting this, but anyway, the third one is accepting war, and the Quraysh accepted war. But then on top of that, during the war, um, he says that there's essentially three categories. There are people who are actively aggressing against you, who you, you can fight, and there are people who are among them who cease aggression, and you can't fight them. In fact, you have to escort them somewhere safe. And there are people who want to remain neutral in the conflict, and you can't fight them. So it isn't even like you're either with us or against us. Like there's a neutral category explicitly in the text. So um, I, I, I think this is overlooked because people are always looking for justifications to fight. Um, but that's, that's what's written. Uh, which makes it easy for me. From the Christian perspective, a lot of people are familiar with Thomas Aquinas who came up with the just war theory. And Christians that are both pro-war and the people like the Quakers who are famous for being basically pacifist, they can pull a scripture to support whatever their claim is and again, it's a lot of times taken out of context because there's a scripture that says that everyone will turn their uh, swords into plowshares. And then there's another verse that says, if you do not have a sword, go buy one. So that there are, you know, again, conflicting sorts of things if you don't read them in context. And uh, I think... Historically, there are a lot of examples of Christians who are pacifists. And 
I, I'm definitely not a pacifist, but to quote Lee Wrights, I don't believe I have to kill a man to prove it. So uh, I think that there's definitely the conscientious objector that is very strong in Christian history, but there are also a lot of people that basically, that are looking for a fight and they pretty much uh, pull an Abe Lincoln and say, well, God is on our side. Whether you're right or wrong, people like to say God is on our side. And the Crusades, which is vastly overlooked in Christian history, was done by people claiming to be Christians who went and just slaughtered the random people. So if you want to look at history to say that Christianity is violent, you can find that history. But it definitely is not in, uh, you know, in line with the teachings of the Messiah, and it's not in line with all of the other history of peaceful Christians. Yuri, uh, may I ask uh, about uh, women right? Uh, I see, like in different Muslim countries, like in Turkey, uh, there are maybe more freedom for women, and like in Afghanistan, probably less. And also, another question, a little bit connected, like what kind of uh, Muslim are here in New Hampshire? I see this community growing, like there is a center in Manchester and probably in some other places, so like... Uh, sure. Um, I always feel really uncomfortable talking about women's rights as a man, and um, my wife is actually a really effective speaker on this topic, but she's not here, unfortunately. Um, so. As far as like what women's sort of uh, like civil rights are in Muslim countries, it's devastating. It's 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 uh, tyrannical and oppressive, and it's it's terrible. Um, as far as like what women's rights are in Islam, like it's a it's a whole it's a whole genre of scholarship. Like there's essentially um, so in 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 Muhammad's lifetime, the normative practice was for women to walk around topless, and um, that was normal. And you had people who converted to Islam who were then told to sort of cover themselves out of modesty, but it was never, uh, it was never like enforced through any means, and it was also tended to be gradual. So you had people who converted and they didn't dress the part the next day. But for some reason, I think because it's the most like outward expression, and it sounds actually really similar to the comments we heard about uh, Old Testament Judaism, because it's an outward expression and because people feel insecure about their, their, their uh, religion's place in society, they feel this social pressure all the time to always look this important, to look this sort of pure, pure part, right? Um, so, uh, it's, 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 a tough, it's a tough thing to discuss. I don't really, I don't really have a lot of expertise on the subject. Um, I know that, that my wife wears the hijab, uh, which is the, um, the covering of, of the hair, but not the face. Um, but, you know, she, she does it completely on her own. If she decided not to, I, I mean, I wouldn't sweat two seconds about it. it it's, uh, it's sort of her interpretation, and, and it's what she's chosen to do, and that's fine with me. There are um, there's there's different rulings about the dress code. Why does this always turn into a discussion about dress code? All right, let's think about some other women's rights. Um, like uh, education, for example. Education. Women should absolutely be educated. Um, the the. The, the Prophet's wives were the first educators of the Muslims. Like they were some of the first like like literate Muslims, some of the first record keepers. Like that's a complete innovation, the idea that women shouldn't be educated. And I, I, I can't speak to the history of why that is, but um, it's it's a, it's not it, it, it's a, it's it's completely new and it's completely oppressive, um, which is pretty obvious, I think. Um, what was what were some of the other? You asked me a couple of questions. Can you give me some of the other ones? A little bit about uh, Muslims in New Hampshire. Oh, New Hampshire, right? So um, when I first signed the um, the Declaration of Intent for the Free State Project, I wrote to the Islamic Center in Manchester and I said, "Hey, you know, I'm thinking about moving out there. Can I trade some emails? Can I get to know some of you?" And I never got any response. So I have no I have no idea what the Muslim community is like here. Um, you know, but there's some Muslims that come, so maybe I could convince some of my friends to move too. I have no idea. Um, but I can speak about uh, Muslim immigration. 
if that if, if it's likely to be similar to what's sort of normal in New Hampshire. You right now you have a generation of people who are sort of uh, like the older generation is sort of trying to sort of keep this sort of like um, the traditions, their sort of ethnic and cultural traditions from from back home. And so they come here from, from Pakistan, from India, from Arab countries, from Africa, and they have children here. And they quickly discover that their mosque is no longer ethnically homogenous the way that it is at home, which means that they're now exposed to cultural traditions from Muslims in countries that are practicing completely different than they are. And for a lot of them, this is like, it's not just the culture shock of coming to America and realizing that there's a whole diversity of lifestyles going on that's different, but they're also encountering a, com a whole diversity of, of Muslim lifestyles that they didn't have at home because things are very homogenous in a lot of these countries. And then they're discovering that their children pick and choose. And their, their children like maybe like take some of their cultural traditions, um, but they also want to marry into like other races and other ethnicities and other, you know, and so um, it, it has sort of forced them to let go to a large extent because if you go to some of these, I mean, if you go to some places in India or Afghanistan, it matters what village your spouse is from. Like, there's a lot of status tied up into this, this stuff. Well, and, and in Afghanistan and India, my understanding is that there's a lot of arranged marriages, so yeah. people aren't really picking their spouse. Sure. The family is picking the spouse for them. So this is another kind of funny thing. Like I am essentially in an arranged marriage. Uh, so um, I uh, had a good friend who uh, married this woman, and he and she began going through their list of friends and deciding who they thought would be good together. <laughs> and they introduced me to my wife. <laughs> there should be more of that in libertarianism, <laughs> just because there's not a lot of women. So it should be like, oh, this guy, he's really good. Let's find a woman for him. And be like, oh, you. And <laughs> no, I, I just think that it's one of those interesting things that, you know, there, there are definitely benefits to. And right. if done consensually, you know, like, I, I definitely not, you know, forcing and, anyone into arranged marriages. But, 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 but you were totally right, though. This is the thing. Like, like, they, they recognize that amongst all of their friends, there are not that many political radicals, there are no. not that many political activists, there are not that many people who, like my wife is a civil rights attorney, so like how cool is that for yeah. an activist to have a civil rights attorney who also has spousal privilege? Uh, <laughs> And so that's an arranged marriage, right? Like it's not like it's not like her parents came and picked me out or something like that. But the point is, is that a suggestion is made, and then we take it upon ourselves to decide whether or not we want to pursue that, right? Yeah. When when arranged marriage gets nasty is when it's up to the father and nobody asks the woman's permission, and that's completely outside the Islamic tradition. Uh, so, I think we have time for one more question. If anybody has anything, um, I guess I'll start off by saying. Um, I was actually kicked out of my church. I get to put that on my rebel resume. Um, the pastor was swindling thousands of dollars and giving contracts to his friends, and we called him out on it. And uh, I got kicked out, and I couldn't help but see the statism, not only that's, you know, if you're a Christian, then you are Republican, and you're for America. Um, the statism that's bred within church itself, the hierarchy of church sucks. Yes. And Everywhere, I don't know. I can't speak for the Muslim community, um, but the pastor is on a completely different level. The deacon board is on a completely different level from the person, um, and I've experienced that firsthand. And like, how do you even deal with something like that? And like, the second question is, um, like, Christian religion nowadays, at least, ninety percent of them do not read the Bible. They are yes. Christians because it's a label and it's nice. Uh, and it's really weird in churches nowadays, it's kind of the same thing as the state. Uh, this is what you, you believe, shut up and don't think about it. Go home after church and watch football, that's it. Uh, how do you deal with something like that as well? Uh, I'll answer the first question first of how do you deal with the, state of, the statism in church. I've left organized religion. And that was something that was very tough for me to do because I grew up, for the most part, from you know, about the age of 10, 
until I was nearly 30, going to church every week. Read the Bible, and I was actually studying to become a pastor. I still have three courses left on a uh, pastoral studies degree from a uh, correspondence school. And one of these days I'll get around to doing the courses just to actually finish the program. But as somebody that was basically studying, studying to become a preacher, it was very hard for me to leave the church. But I have not left the faith, if that makes any sense. So it was one of those things of after I was studying and had finally read the entire Bible through twice, and you know, having gone to church and then seeing the inner workings, it was one of those things of where I realized that basically the state had become the god of the church and they were teaching a watered down version and church is essentially a business. And it's not one of these happy consensual businesses, it's one of these nasty, ugly, let's manipulate people into becoming our customers sort of businesses. There's, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the mega churches that get like 40,000 people. And the preacher says, if you just send me a thousand dollars, God will bless you. And he takes a scripture totally out of context. And the only person getting blessed is the preacher that's getting a thousand dollars from 40,000 people. Plus however many thousands of people or millions watch at home that are sending you know, the last dime they have. I can't pay my rent this week, but if I send the preacher all of my money, then God will pay off my house. It's manipulation, and it's manipulation at like the core level to where you can manipulate people. Of You will be provided for if you just give me everything you have, and it's praying with an E, P-R-E-Y, praying on people's fears and desires and their core instincts of survival, and it's horrible. So the way I deal with it is I've left the church. Something I think people have to keep in mind is that uh, most churches, most mosques, most temples of any kind are in a sense created by the state in the same way that a corporation is created by the state. Um, so because of, because of the tax statuses that they file for, there are rules that they have to abide by. And that's not just like what they're allowed to say politically, that's also a, a lot about like the way they're structured internally. So for example, in, in a mosque, in most of the mosques that I, that I go to, I'm, I'm not home to a particular mosque, I kind of roam around. Um, the board of directors has more power than the imam as far as what the policy in the mosque is. The imam is essentially somebody who stands up and delivers the same sermon every week in a lot of mosques. Like literally, he'll recite the same sermon in Arabic and most of his congregation doesn't understand it. And uh, it's the board of directors and the sort of democratic process of electing board of directors and the sort of like donor base and like these guys are the ones that set the policy as far as how the mosque is used as a community center. And so that's what changes the culture of the mosque. And they maybe select the imams, um, but they're the ones who are sort of going to decide what the rules are in the building and what kind of community activities are going to happen and things like that. And that is entirely a function of the tax status and, and being incorporated that you have, like you literally have to have this person called a treasurer, you have to have a person called whatever. Like Those, those are entirely state created functions and so they're going to be like states, unfortunately. Um, but at the, at, the, at the same time you have a sort of counter phenomenon that's happening with, with Muslims and that is that you have, um, they, uh, the, the sort of commonly call them, we're calling them celebrity sheikhs. They're these, these, these scholars that go around the country from mosque to mosque and they guest speak. And so it's not your Friday sermon, it's like Saturday the community gets together and drinks chai and listens to the scholar. And if the scholar happens to say something, that is uh, that the mosque doesn't want to be held accountable for. Well, he's not a member of their mosque, and they didn't know he was going to say that, right? So you have this sort of like free speech that's still happening. And in my area, there's a particular guy who I swear is a libertarian, um, <laughs> because he talks about precious metals a lot. 
and he talks about like he he worked with John Taylor Gatto to put together a school curriculum for some Islamic schools, and, he ta and it's called uh, Raising Sovereign Children. Right, so it's like. <laughs> Uh, so he that goes to Pork Fest. What's that? Bring that guy to Pork Fest. He's a very busy guy. He's actually global at this point. He flies around to other countries. And anyway, the, the, my point is, is he gets to go around and, and deliver what are not officially sermons, but what are lectures. And so you kind of get some like real legitimate teaching from people that do that. Um, but I mean, the mosque is a state institution even here. So I mean, I don't know how you fight the hierarchy. I just avoid it. All right, I, I'm fairly certain we're out of time. We might actually have gone over. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out and uh, thank the volunteers who have recorded this. And I'd like to thank Gabby. And if you have not yet read my book, The Anarcho Teachings of Yeshua, or Dobby's book, Voluntary Islam, those are available at The Lazy Goat. Dobby might also be walking around with some copies. Uh, I've also, uh, I've uh, diverted to fiction, so if you like zombies, I am giving away a free pre-print edition of a novel I'm working on. I've got 13 chapters, it's about a third of the story, and it's about a 10-year-old boy surviving a zombie apocalypse alone in New Hampshire. So, uh, if you're interested in that, uh, come find me. Thank you.